Welcome to our Unity game development tutorial series. In this tutorial, we will build the 8 puzzle game and integrate A star pathfinding to solve it. This tutorial is divided into three sections. First, we will focus on implementing the 8 puzzle game functionality, emphasizing the programming aspects over design elements. Next, we will delve into implementing our pathfinding algorithms, including the A star, Dijkstra's, and Greedy Best first search. Finally, we will apply these pathfinding algorithms to solve various configurations of the 8 puzzle. The 8 puzzle problem was invented and popularized by Noyes Palmer Chapman in the 1870s. It's a smaller version of the more well known 15 puzzle, consisting of a 3 by 3 grid with 8 numbered square blocks and one blank square. The objective of the puzzle is to rearrange the blocks into a specific order typically shown with the blank square either at the beginning or end of the sequence. Blocks can be moved horizontally or vertically into the blank square to achieve the goal state. The 8 puzzle represents the largest possible end puzzle that can be completely solved. While it is straightforward, it presents a substantial problem space. Larger variants like the 15 puzzle exist but cannot be entirely solved. This complexity classifies the n by n extension of the 8 puzzle as an NP hard problem. The 8 puzzle encompasses nine factorial possible tile permutation states. Among these states, every second permutation is solvable. Therefore, there are a total of nine factorial divided by two, which is 181,440 solvable problem states. Alexander Reinfeld from the Paderborn Center for Parallel Computing, Germany, demonstrated that the average length of all optimal solution paths is approximately 22 moves for any random configuration. Across the 181,440 solvable configurations, there are a total of 500,880 optimal solutions, providing an average solution density of 2.76 solutions per problem, with the range of solutions varying from 1 to 64. The difficulty in solving the puzzle involves building the potential search tree and determining the most efficient path from the initial state to the goal state. To identify the optimal path, we employ heuristic search. Heuristic search is a method used to solve search problems more quickly than traditional methods. It often provides an approximate solution when conventional methods cannot, offering a generalized and approximate approach to problem solving. In simple terms, heuristic search can be likened to a rule of thumb or common sense knowledge. While the answer isn't guaranteed to be accurate, it aids in reaching a decision swiftly, sacrificing optimality, completeness, accuracy, or precision for speed. Heuristic searches commonly involve heuristic values. A heuristic value assigned to a node within the construction graph aims to capture the significance of that node's value, such as cost or gain. Heuristic search, a form of informed search, utilizes this heuristic value to optimize the search. During each branching step, the search evaluates the heuristic value and selects which branch to pursue by ranking alternatives. There are various types of heuristic search algorithms, with one notable example being the A star search algorithm. Let's start by creating a new Unity 3D project. Name it 8Puzzle. Download the images provided in the link below to assist you with the tutorial. Once the project is loaded, go to the project window and create a new folder called Resources. Drag and drop the downloaded assets folder called Images to the Resources folder. We will use it later in our tutorial. After that, select the main camera, go to the inspector and set the clear flag to solid color. Change the projection to orthographic and size to 2.5. Set the position to be 0, minus 0 0.2 and minus 10 in the X, Y and Z axis, and then change the RGB color to 50, 100 and 255 to make the background bright blue. From the project window, go to the Resources folder, right-click and create a new material. Name it Tile Material. In the Hierarchy window, right-click and create a quad game object. 
rename it to tile. Go to the inspector and reset the transform. Then, set the scale values to 0 0.98, 0 0.98, and 1 on the X, Y, and Z axes. Add a box collider component so that we can perform a ray intersection on it. After that, drag the tile material to this game object to associate the material. In the resources folder, create a new folder called prefabs, drag and drop the tile game object to this folder and make it a prefab. Remove or hide the tile game object from the scene. Right, click on the hierarchy window and create a new empty game object. Name it puzzle board. Select this game object, go to the inspector and reset the transform. We shall now create the frame for the puzzle board. You could implement this frame in many ways. For this tutorial, we are going to use cubes. Select the puzzle board game object from the hierarchy window. Right click on it and create a new empty game object. Name it frame. Select the frame game object, right click on it and create a new cube game object. Resize it by setting the scale values to 3.1, 0 0.1 and 0 0.1 on the X, Y and Z axis. From the images folder in resources, drag and drop the wood underscore dark texture to the cube. Duplicate this cube three times, rename them to up, right, down, and left. Select the up cube and set the position to zero, 1.575 and 0 in the X, Y, and Z axis. Select the down cube and set the position to 0, minus 1.575 and 0 in the X, Y, and Z axis. Select the right cube and set the position to minus 1.575, 0 and 0 in the X, Y, and Z axis. Set the rotation values to 0, 0, and 90. Similarly, select the left cube and set the position to 1.575, 0 and 0 in the X, Y, and Z axis. Set the rotation values to 0, 0, and 90. Once again, select the frame game object from the hierarchy, right click, and create a quad game object. Set the position to 0, 0, and 0 0.1. Set the scale to 3.1, 3.1 and 1 on the X, Y, and Z axis. From the images folder in resources, drag and drop the wood underscore light texture to the quad. We will now create a new script to attach to the puzzle board game object. To do so, we will first create a new folder and name it scripts. We shall put all our scripts for the project inside this folder. Right click on the project window and create a new C -sharp script file. Name it puzzle board. Associate this script with the puzzle board game object. Double click and open it in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. We add the variable to set the tile prefab. We will associate it with the tile prefab we created earlier. Next, we define a new function named createTiles and invoke it from the start method. This method will be responsible for creating the nine tiles of the puzzle. We will now define the variable tiles location as a list of vector three objects representing specific coordinates in 3D space. Each vector three in this list corresponds to a location where a tile will be positioned. These positions are used as reference points for placing the nine tiles in a specific layout or arrangement within the scene. Next, we define a list of game object named tiles as an empty list that will store references to the instantiated tile game objects. This list is intended to keep track of all the tiles created dynamically during runtime. In the create tiles method, we iterate through the tiles location list using a for loop to instantiate and position tiles based on the predefined locations. For each iteration, we instantiate a new game object named tile by cloning the tile prefab. We assign a unique name to each instantiated tile by converting the index to string. 
we set the parent of the instantiated tile to the current object's transform, ensuring that the tile becomes a child of the object containing this script. We add the instantiated tile to a tiles list to keep track of all tiles created. Finally, we position the instantiated tile at the corresponding vector 3 location from the tiles location. Go to the Unity Editor. Associate the tile prefab from the prefabs folder into the tile prefab field of the script. Click play, you should be able to see the tiles created. We have not yet assigned any image to these tiles. We shall proceed to assign a texture to these tiles next. To establish a puzzle image and subsequently divide this image into separate texture tiles, we begin by defining a new variable that is a list of textures. This variable will be named puzzle images. The reason for using a list instead of a single image is to allow the player to choose from multiple images by clicking a next image button on the screen, a feature we will implement later in the game. We also add an integer variable to store the current image index, which is set to default as zero. Next, we will define a new function called setTexture that is responsible for setting textures on individual tiles based on the current puzzle image selected from the puzzle images list. First, we retrieve the current texture from the puzzle images list using the current texture index. We then determine the number of rows for tiling and calculate the size of each tile based on the main texture's width. Subsequently, we iterate through the first eight tiles in the tiles list. For each tile, we retrieve its renderer component and access its material. We compute the row and column index of the tile within the tile grid. Using these indices, we calculate the minimum texture coordinates for the tile based on its position within the grid and the texture size. We then assign the main texture to the material of the tile and set the texture scale and offset to correctly map the portion of the main texture onto the tile. Finally, we ensure that the ninth tile representing the empty space in the puzzle, is visually transparent by setting its material color to 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 0.0, 0 0.0, which corresponds to full transparency. This approach effectively sets up the texture mapping for the puzzle tiles, aligning them with the appropriate sections of the main texture while ensuring that the empty space tile remains transparent. Next, we define a new function named init, and within this init function, we invoke setTexture. We invoke init from the start method. The purpose of separating the call to init instead of directly invoking setTexture from start is to facilitate the ability to call init on demand whenever we change the puzzle image to the next image. This approach allows for flexibility in initializing and updating the puzzle texture based on user interaction or changes in game state. Go to the Unity Editor. Select the Puzzle Board Game object from the hierarchy. In the Inspector window, adjust the puzzle image's array length to 6. Next, populate each of these puzzle image's slots by dragging and dropping images from the Images folder within the Resources directory. Click the Play button to observe the tiles that are generated based on the first image specified in the puzzle image's list. The reason you see the last tile appearing black is because we neglected to configure the rendering mode to transparent in the tile material material settings. Open the tile material by double clicking it and configure the rendering mode to transparent. After making this adjustment, click play again and you should now see the tiles displayed correctly. We shall now implement the function nextImage, which is designed to switch to the next image in the puzzle images list.
In this method, we first increment the current texture index variable to move to the next image. If current texture index reaches the count of puzzle images, we reset current texture index back to zero to start again from the beginning of the list. After adjusting the index, we call the init function to initialize and update the puzzle tiles based on the newly selected image. Next, we incorporate an input key binding to test the next image functionality in the update method. We assign the end key as the trigger to activate the next image action, allowing users to cycle through images by pressing the designated key. In the Unity editor, Enter play mode and press the N key to observe the image changing. The images cycle sequentially through indices 0 to 5 and then loop back to 0, allowing you to test and view the image transitions during runtime. To solve the 8 puzzle problem, we need a data structure to represent the puzzle's tiles, which we'll refer to as the puzzle's state. Each state represents a unique combination of tiles, and throughout our solving process, we'll need to manage potentially hundreds or thousands of these states. Each distinct tile arrangement in the puzzle corresponds to a node within a tree data structure. For representing these states, we will use an integer array where the array indices correspond to specific tile positions, and the values stored at these indices represent the tile numbers. In this one-dimensional array representation, each index is fixed and represents a predefined tile location. For example, index 0 corresponds to the top left tile, index 1 to the top center tile, and so on up to index 8 for the bottom right tile. The value stored at each index indicates the actual tile number present in that location. For instance, in a given state, as seen here, index 0 holds the value 2, index 1 holds 3, and index 8 holds 7, indicating the tile numbers in those respective positions. Index 4 holds the empty tile. By manipulating the values in this array representation, while adhering to the constraint of where the empty tile can move with each action, we can progress towards reaching the goal state of the puzzle. This approach allows us to efficiently track and navigate through the various configurations of the puzzle during the solving process. We shall now implement this data structure to represent the puzzle state. From the project window, select the scripts folder, right click, and create a new C -sharp script file. Name it puzzle state. Double click and open the file in Visual Studio. We remove mono behavior inheritance from our class to make it a pure C -sharp class and not a mono behavior. We also remove the start and update methods from the class. We will derive the puzzle state class from iEquatable generic so that instances of puzzle state can be compared for equality. Inside this class, we define two properties. The R property is an integer array that represents the current arrangement of tiles in the puzzle state. We initialize R with a new integer array of size 9 using an array initializer. The empty tile index property represents the index of the empty tile within the puzzle state. In the default constructor, we initialize R to contain values from 0 to 8 in sequential order using enumerable dot range. This means R will be initialized as 0, 1 to 8, where each value corresponds to a tile number in the puzzle. Additionally, we set empty tile index to 8 in this case. We will now create another constructor for the puzzle state class that takes another puzzle state object as a parameter. This constructor is used to create a copy of an existing puzzle state object. This functionality will be essential for managing and manipulating puzzle states during the solving process while preserving the integrity of the original state. Next, we implement the equals method in the puzzle state class to compare the tile arrangements of the current puzzle state object with another puzzle state object. To do so, we compare if the arrays have identical elements in the same order. If so, the method returns true. After that, we create an overridden equals method in the puzzle state class that explicitly handles comparisons with objects of type object.
This overridden method internally calls the equals method specific to puzzle state objects. This implementation ensures that the equals method defined for puzzle state is invoked when comparing objects of this type, aligning with the requirements of the iEquatable interface. Additionally, we implement an overridden get hash code method in the puzzle state class to compute a hash code for puzzle state objects. We will amend this function later. Next, we implement two methods within the puzzle state class to handle puzzle state manipulation. The find empty tile index method identifies the current index of the empty tile within the array. This method updates the empty tile index property of the puzzle state object to reflect the position of the empty tile within the puzzle state. Following that, the swap with empty method facilitates the swapping of the tile at the specified index with the empty tile in the array. This method uses tuple deconstruction to efficiently swap the tile values. After performing the swap, the method updates the empty tile index to the new position of the empty tile. These methods are essential for manipulating the puzzle state during the solving process, allowing for tile swaps and updates to explore different configurations of the puzzle. Our next objective is to construct the graph of neighbors for the eight puzzle problem. This involves determining possible moves or neighbor indices for each of the nine tile indices. For example, starting with tile index 0, the neighboring indices where the empty tile can move are indices 1 and 3. Similarly, for tile index 1, the neighbors are indices 0, 2, and 4, and so on. We will summarize this relationship in a list of neighbor indices for each tile index. With this mapping in place, we can then easily determine the neighbors for any tile index. For instance, for tile index 6, the neighbors are tile indices 7 and 3. It's important to note that these indices refer to positions within the array representation of the puzzle state, not the actual values stored in those array elements. Now, let's proceed to implement this functionality. We will utilize static variables and methods for this purpose. We will also contain this code with a region called neighbors. First, we define a dictionary that will hold the key value pair of index and the list of neighboring indices, as shown in the diagram. We create a static private field named edges in the puzzle state class. We declare edges as a dictionary where the key is an integer representing a tile index, and the value associated with each key is a list of integers representing neighboring tile indices. This dictionary will serve as a data structure to store information about the adjacency relationships between tiles in the puzzle grid. Now, we will implement the create neighbor indices method within the puzzle state class. This method is responsible for generating neighboring indices for each tile in a puzzle grid of specified rows or columns, defaulted to three for a three by three grid. The method iterates over each row and column combination using nested for loops. For each tile at position i, j, it calculates the index in a linearized grid. Then, it creates a list of integers called neighbor indices to store the indices of neighboring tiles. It adds valid neighboring indices based on boundary conditions. If a neighboring index is valid, it is added to neighbor indices list. Finally, the neighbor indices list is assigned to the edges dictionary with the current tile index as the key, mapping to its list of neighboring indices. This method initializes the edges dictionary with adjacency information for each tile, facilitating efficient neighbor lookups during puzzle solving operations. Note that this functionality could be extracted into a separate static class for modularity and clarity. Then we implement the getNeighborIndices function that returns the list of neighboring indices for a given index.
Finally, we will implement the method getNeighborVempty within the PuzzleState class. This static method takes a PuzzleState object as input and is responsible for generating a list of neighboring puzzle states resulting from possible moves of the empty tile. First, the method initializes an empty list neighbors to store the generated neighboring puzzle states. It retrieves the current index of the empty tile from the state object's empty tile index property. Next, it calls the getNeighborIndices method to obtain a list of indices representing neighboring tiles of the empty tile. Then, for each neighbor index in neighbor indices, the method creates a new puzzle state object new underscore state as a copy of the input state using the copy constructor. It then swaps the empty tile with the tile at neighbor index using the swap with empty method, modifying new underscore state to represent a puzzle state resulting from the tile swap. The modified new underscore state is added to the neighbors list. Finally, the method returns the list neighbors containing all possible neighboring puzzle states resulting from moving the empty tile to adjacent positions. We will now move on to our puzzle board script and make the necessary updates to allow the board tiles configuration by setting a puzzle state. To do so, we will add a new method called setPuzzleState. Before we implement this function, we will add a new private variable called the current state of type puzzle state. This variable will represent the current state of the puzzle board. We then implement the function set puzzle state, which updates the current puzzle state with a new state provided as an argument. This function iterates through the tile array of the puzzle state and adjusts the position of each corresponding game object tile based on the tiles locations list. Each tile's position is updated to match its designated location in the tiles locations list, effectively rearranging the visual representation of the puzzle according to the specified state. After that, we go to the init method and invoke this set puzzle state method with a default puzzle state. We shall now implement the moving or sliding of tiles based on the left mouse button click. To do so, we will implement a new method called PickTile. This function is responsible for identifying and returning the game object that is clicked on in the 3D world space using the mouse. First, we retrieve the mouse position in screen coordinates using input.mouseposition. Next, we create a ray originating from the camera and passing through the mouse position in 2D screen space, converting it into a 3D world space ray. We then perform a physics ray cast using physics.raycast to check if this ray intersects with any collider in the scene. If the ray hits an object, it retrieves the game object that was hit, and this game object is returned by the function. If the ray does not hit any object, the function returns null. We now go to the update method and handle our mouse click event. This code segment will handle the player's input of clicking on a tile to swap it with the empty space in the puzzle. Here, we use input.getMouseButtonDown to detect a left mouse button click. If a left click is detected, we call the pictile function to retrieve the game object that was clicked on. If OBJ is not null, we proceed to check if the clicked tile is a valid neighbor of the empty tile in the current puzzle state. This is done by retrieving the index of the empty tile and then getting a list of neighbor indices for this empty tile. We iterate through these neighbor indices. And if the name of the clicked game object matches the number on any of the neighboring tiles in the current state, we perform a tile swap using current state dot swap with empty and update the puzzle state using set puzzle state. Thus, handling the player's input of clicking on a tile to swap it with the empty space in the puzzle. After that, we go to the start method, and before invoking any other calls, we invoke puzzle state dot create neighbor indices to generate all neighboring indices adjacent C list. Go to the Unity editor and click play. Now you can click on any tile adjacent to the empty tile to swap it with the empty tile. As observed, the tile movement lacks smoothness in its visual appearance. Now, we'll implement a coroutine to create a smoother animation for tile movement. Let's proceed with implementing a method named coroutine underscore move over seconds to achieve this effect.
This coroutine accepts three parameters, object to move, the game object that needs to be moved, and the target position where the game object should move, and seconds, the duration over which the movement should occur. Within this coroutine, we initialize elapsed time to zero and starting pause to the current position of object to move. We then enter a while loop that runs until elapsed time reaches seconds. During each iteration of the loop, we update the position of object to move using vector 3.lerp to smoothly interpolate between starting pos and n based on the ratio of elapsed time to seconds. This interpolation creates a smooth movement effect. After each iteration, we increment elapsed time by time, delta time to track the passage of time. Finally, when the loop completes, we ensure that object to move is precisely positioned at end. The yield return new wait for end of frame statement ensures that this coroutine runs once per frame. Next, we recreate the set puzzle state function with an additional parameter called duration. Within this function, for each tile, we invoke coroutine underscore move over seconds with the specified duration. We then go to the update method and add a duration of 0.2 seconds to the set puzzle state method upon mouse clicking. Go to the Unity editor and click play. Now when you click on any tile adjacent to the empty tile, you will notice that the tile smoothly moves to swap places with the empty tile. To randomize the tiles, we'll use a less conventional approach. We'll begin with a solved state and then randomly swap tiles with the empty tile for a specified number of moves. This method allows us to visually animate the randomization. Let's implement a new coroutine named coroutine underscore randomize. Before we implement this coroutine, let's define a Boolean type variable called randomizing and set it to false by default. The coroutine underscore randomize takes in two parameters depth, which represents the number of random moves to perform, and duration per move, indicating the duration in seconds of each animated move. Inside the coroutine, we set the flag randomizing to true to indicate that randomization is in progress. Then, we initiate a loop that runs for depth iterations. Within each iteration, we retrieve the list of neighboring states using puzzle state dot get neighbor of empty of the current state. We randomly select a neighbor index and swap it with the empty tile in the current state using current state dot swap with empty. After each swap, we update the puzzle state visually by calling set puzzle state to animate the move over a specified duration. The coroutine pauses execution for the specified duration using yield return new wait for seconds with the duration per move before proceeding to the next random move. Once all random moves are completed, we set randomizing back to false. After that, we go to the update method and add the R key binding to trigger the randomization of tiles. Go to the Unity editor and click play. Press the R key to see the randomization of tiles in progress. We shall now implement a basic UI for our 8 puzzle game. The UI will contain 4 buttons and 2 texts. You can use legacy buttons and texts, or text mesh pro buttons and texts. For this tutorial, I have created legacy buttons and texts. The four buttons are for randomization. Going to next image, resetting the tiles to the randomized state after you have made some moves, and solving the puzzle by A star algorithm. We have not yet implemented the resetting and solving the puzzle by A star algorithm. The two text fields are to show status messages and the number of moves. Go ahead and implement these UI elements into a canvas. I have sped up the video here, as this process is simple.
Go to the puzzle board script and add two public text UI variables. We shall attach the two text UI elements from the Unity inspector here. The first text variable is called the status text, and the second text variable is called the number of moves text. After that, we add a variable solved initialized to false. This variable will be used to track whether the puzzle is solved or not. Next, we add a variable goal state that represents the state of the puzzle that we want to achieve to consider the puzzle solved. We also declare a variable randomized state that will hold the randomly generated state of the puzzle. Finally, we declare an integer variable number of moves initialized to zero. This variable will keep track of the number of moves made during the puzzle solving process. After that, we move to the init method where several actions are implemented. Firstly, the status text is updated to inform the player that the puzzle is currently in a solved state and needs to be randomized in order to begin playing. Additionally, the number of moves variable is reset to zero, initializing the move count for the new puzzle session. The solved variable is then set to true. Lastly, the visibility of number of moves text is toggled off by deactivating its associated game object. This action hides the UI element displaying the number of moves because no moves have been made yet or because the puzzle is in its initial state. Next, we go to the update method and add lines of code to manage the puzzle solving process. Firstly, we increment the number of moves is by one. Subsequently, we set the visibility of number of moves text by setting its associated game object to active. The number of moves text text content is then updated to reflect the current move count. After that, we update the solved variable by checking if the current state equals the goal state. If the puzzle is solved, we update the visibility of status text to active. The text content of status text is updated to inform the player of their achievement and prompt them to proceed to the next puzzle by clicking a designated next button. Then, in the coroutine coroutine underscore randomize, we set solve to false to indicate the puzzle is not solved. Next, we hide the status text by deactivating its game object. Finally, we create a new puzzle state object and set it to randomize state by copying the current puzzle state. This will help us to reset the puzzle state. We shall now implement two public methods that we will use to bind to our button clicks. The first method is randomize. Here we first check if the randomizing flag is true. If so, it immediately returns to prevent overlapping randomization processes. Otherwise, it starts a coroutine named coroutine underscore randomize. The next method is the reset method. Here, we reset the puzzle state to the previously randomized configuration. We achieve this by setting the puzzle state to randomized state. Additionally, we reset the number of moves counter to zero and hide the number of moves text UI element by deactivating its associated game object. Go to the Unity editor and attach the two text UI elements to the puzzle board's text fields. After that, select the randomize button and add the on click event to puzzle board's randomize method. Select the reset button and add the on click event to puzzle board's reset method. Select the next image button and add the on click event to puzzle board's next image method. Click play and run. You can now play the game as a player. Go ahead and try it out.
With this, we come to an end of section one. In the next section, we will implement the pathfinding algorithms. In our previous section, we successfully developed a playable version of the eight puzzle game. Now, in this section, we will create a pathfinder that we will use to solve the randomized configurations of the eight puzzle. Go ahead and create a new C Sharp script. Name it Pathfinder. Double click and open it in Visual Studio. Remove mono behavior, then remove the start and update methods. We want our class to be plain C Sharp class and not derived from mono behavior. We start by adding an enumerator type called Pathfinder status. This enum defines the different states that the Pathfinder can be in during its operation. The first state is not underscore initialized. This status indicates that the Pathfinder has not been initialized yet. Initialization typically involves setting up the start and goal nodes for the pathfinding operation and preparing any necessary data structures. When the Pathfinder is in this state, it's not ready to start searching for a path. The next state is success. This state indicates that the Pathfinder has successfully found a path from the start node to the goal node. It means that the pathfinding algorithm has completed its task and identified a valid path that meets the specified criteria. We then add the state failure. This state indicates that the pathfinder has been unable to find a valid path from the start node to the goal node. It could occur due to various reasons, such as an unreachable destination, blocked paths, or limitations of the pathfinding algorithm. Finally, we add the state running. This state indicates that the pathfinder is currently searching for a path. We then define an abstract class called node. Making it abstract means we can't create instances of node directly. Instead, it serves as a blueprint for other classes. Also, it uses a generic type T, which means it can work with any type of data, making it really flexible. We can create nodes to hold different kinds of information. Then we have a property called value. This property is where we store the actual data that the node represents. The get allows us to read the value. The set is marked as private, meaning we can only set the value within this class itself, not from outside. We then define the constructor for our node class. It takes a parameter value of type T, which we then use to set it to the value property. And finally, we have a method called getNeighbors. It is marked as abstract, which means any class that inherits from node will have to implement this method. This method is responsible for finding all the neighboring nodes connected to this node. But because it's abstract, we don't provide an implementation here. Instead, each subclass of node will define its logic for finding neighbors. Depending on how we represent map data, either as a grid or as a graph, we will have a specific implementation of this method. We now create a class named Pathfinder. It is marked as abstract, just like the node class we saw earlier. That means we can't directly create an instance of Pathfinder. Instead, it's meant to be used as a blueprint for other classes that will perform pathfinding algorithms. We use a region to organize our code visually. Think of them as section dividers. First, we define some delegates. Delegates are like function pointers in C++. They're used here to define the signature for calculating costs between nodes. We have two types of costs, heuristic cost, which estimates the cost from a node to the goal, and node traversal cost, which calculates the cost between two neighboring nodes. After that, we end the region. We then start with another region and define a nested class called Pathfinder node. Nested classes are classes defined within another class. We have implemented this class as a nested class here as it will mostly be used by our Pathfinder class. The class implements the iComparable interface, which means instances of this class can be compared to each other. This class is crucial because it represents nodes within the search tree generated by the pathfinding algorithm. Unlike the node class we saw earlier, which was abstract and served as a template for various types of nodes, this class encapsulates a specific node in the search process. Inside the class, we define various properties and methods that will help us manage these nodes during the search process. We start with the property named parent. This property represents the parent node of the current node in the search tree. In other words, it points to the node from which the current node was reached. 
We then add a property called location, which represents the actual node that this Pathfinder node is associated with. It stores the reference to the node in the graph. We then add a few new properties that represent different costs associated with the node. GCost is the cost from the start node to this node, HACost is the heuristic cost from this node to the destination node, and FCost is the total cost of reaching this node, which is the sum of GCost and HCost. After that, we add a constructor for this class. This constructor initializes a Pathfinder node with the given node as its location, the provided parent node, and the specified gcost and hcost. It then calls the setGcost method to set the gcost and update the fcost accordingly. Then we implement the setGcost method. This method updates the node's gcost and recalculates the fcost based on the new gcost and the existing hcost. We will now implement the iComparable interface. This method allows instances of Pathfinder node to be compared based on their fcost. It returns a negative value if the current node's fcost is less than the other node's fcost, zero if they are equal, and a positive value if it's greater. We finish off by calling the end region, and that wraps up the Pathfinder node class. We will now continue with the Pathfinder class by defining another region called properties. Remember that putting sections of code between a region is just a way to organize our code visually, making it easier to understand and navigate. Then we will define a property called status. This property represents the current status of the pathfinder. It can have values like not underscore initialized, running, success, or failure. By default, it's set to not underscore initialized. The get accessor allows us to read the value of status, while the private set accessor means that only methods within this class can change the value of status. After that, we define properties for the start and goal nodes of the Pathfinder. These properties allow us to access the start and goal nodes from outside the class, but they can only be set internally, hence the private set modifier. This encapsulation ensures that only the Pathfinder class can modify these nodes. Lastly, we add another property called current node, which represents the current node that the Pathfinder is exploring. This property allows external classes to access the current node, but it can only be set internally by the Pathfinder class. We end this section of code by adding the end region. We start once again with a region to organize our code. To manage the open and closed lists in the pathfinding algorithm, we will define two lists, open list and closed list. Open list will keep track of nodes that have been discovered but not yet explored, while closed list will store nodes that have already been explored. We will then create a helper method called getListCostNode. This method will take a list of Pathfinder node instances as input and return the node with the lowest fcost. It will iterate through the list, comparing the fcost of each node and keep track of the index of the node with the lowest cost. We will also define another helper method called isInList. This method will check if a specific value of type T is present in the list of Pathfinder node instances. It will iterate through the list and compare the value of each node's location with the given value cell. If a match is found, it will return the index of the item in the list, otherwise it will return minus 1. After that, we end the region. We will now define another region titled Delegates for Action Callbacks, where we will declare delegates to handle changes to internal values. The game will utilize these delegates to represent alterations to the cells and lists visually. These delegates will facilitate triggering specific actions or behaviors in response to various events during the pathfinding process, allowing for visual representation and interaction within the game environment. We start by declaring a delegate type delegate pathfinder node intended to handle methods that take a pathfinder node as a parameter. Following this, we declare instances of the delegate pathfinder node delegate type called the onChange current node, onAddToOpenList, onAddToClosedList, and onDestinationFound. 
These delegates will be assigned methods that take a Pathfinder node as a parameter and will be invoked when certain events occur, such as changes to the current node, addition of a node to the open list, addition of a node to the closed list, and discovery of the destination node. Next, we define another delegate type, delegate no argument, which will handle methods with no parameters. We proceed by creating instances of the delegate no argument delegate type called on started, on running, on failure, and on success. These delegates will be assigned methods with no parameters. They will be invoked when certain events occur, such as the start of the pathfinding algorithm, when the algorithm is running, when the algorithm fails to find a path, and when the algorithm successfully finds a path. Finally, we end the region. Next, we will define a method called reset, which will reset the internal variables for a new search. Within the method, we will first check if the status of the pathfinder is set to running. If it is, we will not perform the reset and simply return from the method. Next, if the pathfinder is not currently running, we will set the current node to null, clear both the open and closed lists, open list and closed list, and reset the status of the pathfinder to not initialized. This reset method will ensure that the pathfinder is ready for a new search by clearing all previous data and resetting its status. It's an essential step before starting a new pathfinding operation. We will now define a method named step, which will handle the progression of the pathfinding algorithm until it either succeeds or fails. Within this method, we'll begin by adding the current node to the closed list. Next, we'll check if the open list is empty. If it is, we'll set the status to failure, invoke the onFailure delegate if it's not null, and return the status. Then, we'll get the least costly element from the open list and make it the new current node. After that, we'll remove the current node from the open list. Now, we'll check if the current node contains the goal cell. If it does, we'll set the status to success, invoke the onDestinationFound delegate if it's not null, invoke the onSuccess delegate, and return the status. Following that, we'll find the neighbors of the current node and traverse each of these neighbors for possible expansion. Within each iteration of the loop, the method algorithm specific implementation is called with the current neighbor node cell as an input parameter. This method is abstract and must be implemented by subclasses of the Pathfinder. It's meant to handle specific implementation details or operations related to the pathfinding algorithm, such as evaluating the cost of moving to the neighbor or updating the path based on the neighbor's properties. Lastly, we'll set the status to running, invoke the onRunning delegate if it's not null, and return the status. Finally, we define the abstract method algorithm specific implementation that is not directly implemented here. This method is expected to be implemented by subclasses and will handle specific implementations required by the pathfinding algorithm. We will now define a method called initialize, which will initialize a new search in the pathfinding algorithm. First, we'll check if the status of the pathfinder is set to running. If it is, we'll return false because pathfinding is already in progress. Next, we'll reset the variables to prepare for the new search operation. Then, we'll set the start and goal nodes for the search. After that, we'll calculate the heuristic cost for the start node using the provided heuristic function heuristic cost.
Now, we'll create a root node with its parent as null and initialize its g-cost to zero and h-cost to the calculated heuristic cost. Subsequently, we will add this root node to the open list, and then we will set the current node to the root node. Then, we'll invoke delegates to inform the caller if they are not null. This includes the onChange current node delegate to notify of the change in the current node, and the onStarted delegate to signify the start of the pathfinding operation. Finally, we will set the status of the pathfinder to running and return true to indicate successful initialization of the search operation. We then bound these three methods within a region for better code organization and clarity. We have now implemented the basic structure of the pathfinder. However, it is not yet able to do the path findings, as we have not implemented any algorithm-specific implementation. We shall now proceed to implement the three well-known types of algorithms for pathfinding. We will start with the first algorithm, known as the Dijkstra's algorithm. Dijkstra's algorithm explores paths uniformly, considering all neighboring nodes without any heuristic guidance towards the goal. It guarantees finding the shortest path, but it can be computationally expensive, especially in large graphs. Since Dijkstra's algorithm does not use any heuristic function and relies solely on the accumulated cost from the start node to each node being considered, the H cost is always zero. We start by defining a subclass of Pathfinder called Dijkstra Pathfinder, which implements Dijkstra's algorithm for pathfinding. Within the Dijkstra Pathfinder class, we will implement the abstract method algorithm specific implementation. It is an override of a method in the superclass. This method is responsible for implementing the specific logic of Dijkstra's algorithm for each cell. In this method, we check if the current cell is not in the closed list, meaning it has not been visited yet. Next, we calculate the tentative cost, g cost, to reach the current cell from the starting node. Since this is Dijkstra's algorithm, we don't consider the heuristic cost or the h cost. Then, we check if the cell is already in the open list. If not, we add it to the open list with the calculated costs. If the cell is already in the open list, we check if the newly calculated cost is less than the existing cost for that cell in the open list. If it is, we update the cost and parent of the cell in the open list. This process ensures that Dijkstra's algorithm explores nodes based on their distance from the start node, updating costs as it discovers shorter paths. Next, we will implement the A star algorithm. The A star algorithm uses a heuristic function to guide the search towards the goal, prioritizing paths that are more likely to lead to the goal. It combines the cost to reach a node from the start, which is the G cost, and an estimated cost to reach the goal from that node, which is the H cost. A star is generally more efficient than Dijkstra's algorithm because it tends to explore fewer nodes while still guaranteeing an optimal solution if an admissible heuristic is used. The A star algorithm performance heavily depends on the quality of the heuristic function. In the worst case, A star may behave similarly to Dijkstra's algorithm, but with a good heuristic, A star can significantly reduce the search space and achieve better performance. We continue by defining a subclass of Pathfinder called A star Pathfinder, which implements the A star algorithm for pathfinding. Within the A star Pathfinder class, we implement the algorithm specific implementation function. In this method, we first check if the current cell is not in the closed list, meaning it has not been visited yet. Next, we calculate the cost to reach the current cell from the start node. This is the cost of the path from the start node to the current cell. We also calculate the heuristic cost, or H cost, from the current cell to the goal node.
Then, we check if the cell is already in the open list. If not, we add it to the open list with the calculated costs. If the cell is already in the open list, we check if the newly calculated cost, the G cost, is less than the existing cost for that cell in the open list. If it is, we update the cost and the parent of the cell in the open list. This process ensures that the A star algorithm explores nodes based on their combined cost, which is G plus H, where G is the actual cost from the start node, and H is the heuristic estimate of the cost to the goal node. Next, we will implement our final algorithm for pathfinding, called the Greedy Best First Search Algorithm. Greedy Best First Search is an uninformed search algorithm that explores a graph by prioritizing nodes based on their heuristic value. It selects the node that appears to be closest to the goal according to a heuristic function without considering the actual cost of reaching that node from the start. In contrast to the Dijkstra algorithm, the Greedy Best First Search algorithm does not use the cost to reach a node from the start. Instead, it purely relies on the heuristic cost to the goal node. Greedy Best First search is fast and can quickly find a solution if the heuristic function is well designed. However, it does not guarantee optimality, meaning it may not always find the shortest path to the goal. Due to its greedy nature, it can get stuck in local optima or loops, especially if the heuristic function overestimates the actual cost to reach the goal. Therefore, while greedy best first search is efficient, it may not always produce the most optimal solution. We can copy and paste the Dijkstra Pathfinder, change the name of the class to Greedy Pathfinder. Then we set the G cost to be zero and H cost as the calculated heuristic cost. The remaining functionality remains unchanged. This process ensures that the Greedy Best First Search algorithm explores nodes based solely on their heuristic values without considering the actual cost from the start node. We have completed implementing the second section, Pathfinder in C Sharp, by applying pathfinding algorithms. In the next section, we will apply the pathfinder to solve the eight puzzle problem. In this final section, we will apply the A star pathfinder to solve the eight puzzle. From the scripts folder, right click and create a new C sharp script file and name it puzzle node. Double click and open it in Visual Studio. Remove mono behavior and the start and update methods. We define the class puzzle node as a subclass of node with type puzzle state, specialized for representing nodes in a puzzle solving algorithm. This class encapsulates a puzzle state object within each node. Within the puzzle node class, we override the constructor to initialize a puzzle node with a specified puzzle state instance, utilizing the base class constructor to set the state value accordingly. In the overridden getNeighbors method of puzzle node, we generate and return a list of neighboring nodes based on the current node's puzzle state, which is represented by the attribute value. We start by obtaining a list of puzzle state objects representing valid moves adjacent to the empty tile within the puzzle state. For each valid neighboring state obtained, we create a new puzzle node instance and add it to the neighbors list. We then return the neighbors list. We will use the Manhattan distance heuristic for its simplicity and ability to estimate the number of moves required to bring a given puzzle state to the solution state. We compute this distance by the sum of the lengths of each tile from where it should belong. The picture shows the Manhattan cost for a specific tiles configuration. We then go to our puzzle state class and implement the cost function. We implement a new function called getManhattanCost that returns an integer value of the total cost for a specific tile arrangement. Inside the function, 
We set up some initial variables. We'll define rows or calls to be three, as our puzzle grid is a three by three grid. We'll also initialize a cost variable to keep track of the total Manhattan distance cost. Now, we'll loop through each element in our puzzle array. For each element V in the array, excluding the empty space, represented by the last element, we'll determine its current position, X, Y, and its goal position, GX, GY, within our grid. To calculate GX goal X position and GY goal Y position for element V, we'll use modulo and integer division operations based on rows or calls. Similarly, we'll calculate X and Y for the current position of V in the array. With the positions determined, we'll compute the Manhattan distance man cost, between the current position and the goal position using the formula. Man cost equals X GX plus Y GY We'll then add this man cost value to our cost variable to accumulate the total Manhattan distance cost for all puzzle elements. Finally, we'll return the accumulated cost, which represents the total Manhattan distance cost for our puzzle state. We will now integrate the Pathfinder to our puzzle board. Go to the puzzle board script and add a new variable called Pathfinder of type A star Pathfinder. We also add a Boolean variable called solving using a star in progress and set it to false by default, and an integer variable called number of moves a star and set it to zero. Then we disable randomization, resetting and changing the image while a pathfinding search is in progress. Next, we will implement two static methods. The first method, Manhattan cost, calculates the Manhattan distance cost between two puzzle states A and goal by calling the getManhattanCost function on the state and returning the result as a floating point value. The second method, traversal cost, is a simple utility function that returns a constant traversal cost of one when transitioning between two puzzle states A and B. After that, we implement a coroutine named coroutine underscore solve. This coroutine is responsible for orchestrating the A-star search algorithm to find a solution path for our puzzle. First, within the coroutine, we set the status text to be active and update its text to indicate that we are currently finding a solution using A-star search. Next, we initialize our Pathfinder object to begin the A star search. We do this by initializing the Pathfinder with a start node based on the randomized state and the goal node. We then enter a while loop that continues to execute as long as the Pathfinder status is running. During each iteration of the loop, we call pathfinder.step to progress the A star search algorithm one step at a time. We use yield return null to yield control back to Unity for one frame before proceeding to the next step of the search. Once the A star search completes, we initiate another coroutine called coroutine underscore show solution to visualize and display the solution path found by the algorithm. If the A star search does not succeed, we log a message indicating that no solution was found. Next, we will implement another coroutine named coroutine underscore show solution in our puzzle solving script. This coroutine handles the visualization and display of the solution path found by the A-star search algorithm. First, within the coroutine, we initialize a list of puzzle state named reverse solution to store the solution path in reverse order. We start by setting node to pathfinder.current node, which represents the final node in the solution path found by the A-star search.
We then enter a while loop that iterates through each node in the solution path. During each iteration, we add the puzzle state of the current node to the reverse solution list, and then move to the parent node to progress along the solution path. After assembling the solution path in reverse order within reverse solution, we update the status text to inform the player that a solution has been found, specifying the number of moves required to solve the puzzle. If the reverse solution list contains at least one puzzle state, we set the puzzle state to the final state in the solution path using the setPuzzleState function. If the reverse solution list contains more than two puzzle states, indicating multiple moves in the solution path, we iterate backwards through the reverse solution list and simulate each move by incrementing the move counter and updating the number of moves text UI element to display the current move count. We then update the puzzle state with a specified delay between each move using yield return new wait for seconds. After displaying the entire solution path through animation, we update the status text to prompt the player to randomize the puzzle for the next playthrough. Finally, we set solving using a star in progress to false to indicate that the A star search process for solving the puzzle has completed. We shall now implement our final method solve. This method is responsible for initiating the process of solving the puzzle using the A star search algorithm. First, within the solve method, we check if the A star search process is already in progress. If it is, we immediately return from the method to prevent overlapping solving attempts. Next, we reset the number of moves S star counter to zero. As we are starting a new solving attempt, we also set solving using S star in progress to true to indicate that we are currently executing the A star search algorithm to solve the puzzle. We then configure the Pathfinder object by assigning our custom heuristic cost function Manhattan cost to pathfinder.heuristicCost and our traversal cost function traversal cost to pathfinder.node traversal cost. These functions are used by the A star search algorithm to calculate costs during the search process. Finally, we start the coroutine underscore solve coroutine using start coroutine to kick off the A star search process. Go to the Unity editor, select the solve button and add the on click event to puzzle board solve method. Click play and run. You can now play the game as a player and solve the puzzle using the A star algorithm. Go ahead, randomize a puzzle board and then click the solve button. And there you have it. We have implemented the 8 puzzle game and integrated A star pathfinding to solve it. We hope you have enjoyed this tutorial. Thank you for watching.